the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. <clears throat> I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Do take a seat. We're going to hear more of God's truth. We've sung God's truth. We've heard. I'm going to hear some more. So I'm going to ask James if he'd come and give us our, our second reading this morning. And then after James has spoken, I'm going to invite Carolyn to come and uh, sing us a song about the Christmas story. Thank you, James. This is from Matthew 1, 18 to 25, the birth of Jesus. 
This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Thank you, Carolyn. Life has come to Bethlehem. I heard of shepherds and angels and wise men. And 
All sorts of people, life has come to Bethlehem. We continue to follow the Christmas story. Can I invite Jill to come and bring us our third reading as we consider the birth of Jesus in the next stage? Thank you. This reading is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. The birth of Jesus, part 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken to the, of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to, in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And then there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Thank you. Can I invite you to stand once more? We're going to sing our next carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, which draws together the promises that we've heard this evening so far and others. So do join in, O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs> take a seat. I think there's a prayer at the end of that song, at the end of that carol, 
Abide with us. Come to us, O Lord Emmanuel. That can be a prayer. We invite the Holy Child into our lives. We continue to hear from the Gospels. Can I invite John to bring us our, our final reading, please? Our final reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. It's about the shepherds and the angels. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you, John. May we be like Mary and ponder these truths that we've heard, ponder these truths that we've sung about this afternoon. And can I invite you to stay seated for this next, it's going to be another video clip, but this one is a song um, about the Christmas story. And there was a key word in the passage that John just read to us, the saviour, the saviour. And that label has been given to Jesus and we hear it in this song. We have sung this song in our church over maybe the recent year around Christmas time. So feel free to enjoy. If you've not heard it before, just watch for the words and, and, and pick out the saviour of the world that we remember and recognise this time of year. Thank you, Steve. Sin. 
and will reign. from the heavens to dwell amongst us reigning in glory on and offers us eternal life if we accept to stand and sing the angel do take a seat. Glory to the newborn king, the angels sang. Glory to the newborn king, we have just sung. In our hearts this Christmas, may we take time to bring glory to the newborn king. May I invite Steve to come and give us God's word and to expound on God's word to us. Thank you, Steve. Well, good afternoon or good evening, is it now? Yeah, probably nearly good evening. Um, great to see you all. I can't believe a, a year's nearly over again. Can you believe it? And it's nearly a year, or it probably is a year, since we were last having our carol service. Not in here, it was in the precinct, if any of you were there. We had a great time. We're a little bit warmer tonight. I remember being wrapped up and it was freezing cold, but we're a bit warmer. So I've been given the um, immense privilege and pleasure of uh, bringing the Christmas message for tonight. So I've entitled it, Christmas Message. It's good, isn't it? Um, I've got a question I want to put out to you, and you can shout out and you can answer just 
one word answers is okay. But I want you to be honest as well. Don't just say what perhaps you think I want to hear or, or whatever. So what does Christmas mean to you? Anybody shout out? Family? Yep. Joy? Food? Thank you for your honesty. Bonus. You'd be lucky. Yeah. Any more? Fun. Yes, that's a good one, isn't it? Fun. And hope. Wonderful. See, they're all the good ones, aren't they? But there's lots and lots. Isn't it? I've written a few here. I've written presents, Christmas trees, Father Christmas, family get together, giving and receiving love, parties, excessive drinking, excessive eating, turkey stuffing, mince pies, chocolate. There's loads, isn't there, that we can think about. But, you know, sadly, there's other things as well. There's loneliness for a lot of people highlighted. Highlighted. There's debt. There's sorrow. Well, you know, most of these things that have been mentioned are just the, the tradition of Christmas. This is a Christmas where, if we're honest, Christ isn't really needed. In fact, for many, he's just not even mentioned. Many of the big stores don't even want to use the name Christmas in case it offends other religions. And yet Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about this life-changing, earth-shattering thing, birth that happened 2,000 years ago. I know it's amazing because 700 years before that, so 700 years before Jesus was born, it was prophesied about this amazing birth in Isaiah. And Isaiah said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. So this whole season is a reminder to us of this greatest gift that mankind could ever receive. Almighty God became a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, if we take Jesus away, then all we have left is the tradition, the tinsel, the trees, the lights, the self-indulgence. Without Jesus, we lose what Christmas really is all about. Without Jesus, we lose all the hope that the Christmas story brings. So what is Christmas all about? You know, in the last six years, me and Irene, it's my wife, We've been blessed with four amazingly beautiful grandchildren. In fact, they're, they're up there as, as some of the greatest gifts that we've ever received. And these four little ones have brought so much joy and laughter into our lives. And we see them as real gifts. We see them as real gifts of, from Almighty God. But, you know, we certainly don't treat them like we treat the gifts that we get at Christmas time, where after a few days, they can be laid aside, discarded, forgotten, sometimes even given away to other people we have a great friend who um, has spent christmas with us every well for the last 12 years christmas dinner and is coming this year as well um he's a severe hoarder and we've tried to help him as much as we can but there was a time when we were in his house and we were trying to help him tidy up a little bit and i found all these unopened christmas presents you could tell some were really really going back a few years there was even some that we'd given him and he's just gone home and he'd thrown them in the cupboard or up on top of a, a big pile of clothes or whatever. But, you know, that's not how we treat our grandchildren. We see them as wonderful gifts from Almighty God. And we always love them and invest time and energy. And so we'll probably give to them sacrificially and put their interests before our own. We know the Bible tells us that Jesus is the greatest gift that anyone can ever receive. The greatest gift that God could give. His only son was given as a saviour to the whole world. And yet for many, he's just laid aside, disregarded, forgotten, ignored, and even rejected. So I'm sure you know the Christmas story. We've heard a lot of it through the scriptures of how Jesus was born in a stable. He was visited by a bunch of shepherds. But did you know that shepherds were seen as the lowest of the low in that day? They were uneducated. They were frowned upon by those around to be a shepherd was seen as one of the lowest positions that you could have. I suppose if you're thinking job-wise, our equivalent could be maybe a road sweeper, which I think is a valid job. But actually, it's not a job that perhaps you aspire to, to be. And yet, these uneducated, unimportant shepherds were told about this amazing birth and were the first to visit the saviour of the world. And then there was the wise men who we've heard about as well. The total opposite to the shepherds, probably educated at the highest standards. Our, our version would be Oxford or Cambridge or, or, or Eton. 
respected by all, and they too are told about the birth of the king. You see, this king is for everyone, the uneducated and the intellectual, the poor and the rich, the young and the old, the despised and the loved, the prostitutes, the drug addicts down back alleys. This is King Jesus, saviour of the world, and he relates to every single one of us without exception. If you're here tonight, then he relates to you as well. So the story continues. The wise men follow a star and then they're asked uh, where the ch child may be found. And word gets to King Herod, who tells him that if we find the child, let him know, because he'd also like to go and worship him. But of course, we know that that's a lie because his aim was to kill him because he alone wanted to be king. He alone wanted to rule. But you know, to follow Jesus means we worship him as king over our lives. And yet even today, many want to kill the name of Jesus. Many want to remove him from the Christmas message so that they can continue to rule over their own lives, so they can worship whoever and whatever they choose to worship rather than worship in Jesus. Another little passage I want to read is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, and I think it's going to be up on the, on the screen there. So the, the um, wise men have just been with Herod and now they're on the way. They've just left Herod. And it says, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So the wise men bring gifts, and really they're quite strange gifts, aren't they? they, they it seems, anyway, to give a baby gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It reminds me of the, the old story. I'm sure you've all heard it, but it's the way I tell them. And it's about three little boys, and they've been chosen to be the wise men in the school nativity. And they were all really excited and the families were really excited. And the first one get up and he's got up and he stood on the stage and he's petrified, but he sees his family there supporting him. And he says, I bring gold. And they all cheered for him. And the teacher was cheering at the side. And the second one got up and he was petrified, but he saw all his family there as well. He said, I bring myrrh. And everyone cheered and the teacher was clapping at the side. And then the third one, he gets up and he stands there and he's petrified. And he sees his family there and the teacher's there waving him on. And he says, I bring. Th and he forgets. And he says, I, I bring. Th and the, the parents are shouting out to him. The teacher shouts out to him. And then he thinks he remembers and he says, uh, Frank, send this. Have you heard it before? Yes. No. Oh, well. Well, you know, the answer to why such random gifts for a child lies in symbolism. These gifts are symbolic. These gifts show us that the wise men knew who they were in the presence of. These gifts show us who this baby really is. See, gold was a metal of kings. When they presented gold to Jesus, they were acknowledging his right to rule. The wise men knew Jesus was the king of kings. Uh, frankincense was used in temple worship. In presenting this gift, these wise, these wise men pointed to Christ as our great high priest the only one whose whole life was acceptable and pleasing to God. The only one who would live a sinless life. And myrrh was used to embalm the dead. So this could be seen as a very odd, if not an offensive, uh, gift to give a baby. But not in this case, because this was a gift of faith. They knew that this was Jesus, the king who the scriptures foretold. The one who would give his life as a ransom for many, who would suffer, die and be raised to life for the sins of the world. You know, for us to understand this Christmas message that we celebrate this year, this at this time of year, we need to recognize that the world is in a mess. And I think we can all see that, can't we, when we watch the news. But we need to understand that mankind, it's our, it's because of us, we're the cause of all the mess through our sinfulness. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means none of us can reach God's standard. But God didn't want to leave us in our mess. And he sent Jesus, born as a baby, lived as a man, and yet was without sin. The sinless saviour died for a sinful world. 
Jesus came to deal with our root cause of all our problems, all our deep issues. And the root cause of all our problems, the Bible calls sin. And sin is putting yourself before God, plain and simply. Sin is living for yourself instead of living for God. You know, God is righteous, holy, and just. And a righteous, holy, and just God must judge justly. That's why all the wrong in the world must be judged. And one day it will be. Jesus is coming back, the Bible says, to judge the living and the dead. But Jesus took that judgment upon himself. The judgment that was rightly ours, he put upon himself on the cross and took it to the cross for, for our sake and for us. He was born to die. He chose to lay aside his majesty, to leave his heavenly throne, to be born a baby, to live as a man, and to give his life as a ransom so that we could live. Beginning of John's gospel, wonderful verse, it says, but to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. This is, this is a gift of Christmas. This is what Christmas is all about. Let's make sure we don't leave Christ out of Christmas. Let's make sure we don't leave Jesus in the manger as a baby. You know, in January the 14th, 1991, around 5.30, is when I understood and received the greatest gift that anyone can ever receive. That morning, I realized I was a man in need of God's forgiveness. And I knew I was a man in rebellion, living in rebellion towards God. And I needed a savior to save me from my rebel ways. I knew there was nothing I could do but trust in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an old hymn that says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. There's nothing I could bring to God and say, well, look, I'm all right. I've done this. I knew that day what the Christmas story was all about. That morning, my life was turned around. I changed direction. The Bible calls it repenting. I turned from my own selfish way and turned back to God. I gave Jesus my life. I gave Jesus my heart. You know, one of the verses in that passage I read really stands out, and it's verse 11. I'll just read it again. Oh. You see, Jonathan did that one, so I feel okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So first it says they fell down and worshipped him. You know, that's the response of the wise men. That was the response of the shepherds. That was the response of me on the 14th of January, 1991. And that should be the res response of each one of us as we remember the birth of Jesus. And I wonder, is that your response today? Secondly, it says, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. They gave Jesus their treasures, their best. And I wonder, what treasures do you have to offer Jesus? You know, the greatest treasure that you have is your life. That is what we should be offering Jesus, our very lives. You know, since I gave my life to Jesus, I can honestly say that my life has been full of purpose and meaning. And I've done some amazingly exciting and scary things in my service to him. I've done two mission trips to India, which was quite it was interesting but scary. I've done a, a mission trip to the Isle of Man. I've met the Queen at Buckingham Palace. I've spent 30 years of my life working on the streets of Manchester with the homeless. And after seven years of marriage, I nearly got divorced. But I met Jesus and we've been married 38 years. And I've never looked back. But, you know, every morning I need to make a conscious decision to live my life for Jesus, to put him first, to be a disciple of Jesus means I must first deny myself, take up my cross and follow him. So as I finish, don't just let the Chris this Christmas come and go. Enjoy it by all means. It's an enjoyable time. But don't let the tinsel and the lights and the presents dictate this special season. Give Jesus your best this Christmas. Give Jesus your life this Christmas and make Jesus the center of this Christmas. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Steve, an encouragement and a challenge. Just before we sing our final carol, 
Um, something that Steve mentioned drew my attention to some words in a song. Um, I'd just like to read these words to you. A million frowning shoppers rush to buy their presents while the old folk live in fear of snow and ice. But the radio sings tinsely and cash tills ring in harmony. Now that we've got Christmas, who needs Christ? Says the world. Now that we've got Christmas, who needs Christ? Maybe people see Christmas without Christ, but we do. We do. May I say a massive thank you to all that have taken part this afternoon. The, the band is amazing. The choir of fantastic angelic voices. Brian with his elf ears. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for those on welcome. Thank you for those on the technical stuff. Thank you for those who've prepared. Now, I need to tell you, there are some amazing mince pies through there. So thank you for those who have prepared the mince pies and those who are going to serve tea and coffee afterwards in a few moments' time. So thank you for everybody who's taken part. May we wish you a blessed Christmas this time. Let's stand and sing our final song, Joy to the World. Thank you. Do join us for tea, coffee, and amazing mince pies. God bless you this Christmas time. Amen. <laughs>